Hi, and welcome to Designed for Life, the podcast that brings design and technology teachers and business leaders from across the UK together as we collectively seek to inspire, energize, and create the workforce of the future. Hi, and welcome to Design for Life, the podcast brought to you by the Design and Technology Association with the help of our partners at the Edge Foundation, without whom this podcast would not be possible. Just a few notes before we start the latest episode. First of all, thank you to everyone who subscribed so far. Our our list is growing constantly, and and I'm, I'm surprised and thrilled at how quickly this is growing. One thing that I would like to ask at the beginning is, if you've not left us a review yet, please, please, please do so. The reviews do matter. Uh, it spreads, helps to spread our audience and helps to get this podcast heard by even more people. So please take a moment, if you like this, at the end of the podcast, please go to wherever you've downloaded from, leave us a short review. It makes all the difference. And so on to the latest episode. This morning, delighted to have Jude Pullen with us. Jude is an award-winning design engineer who many of you may know and recognize from his appearance uh, as part of the design team for BBC's Big Life Fix, something that I know is very, very big with design and technology teachers. The word that comes up most when you look at Jude's various biographies online is passion, and it's something that's come over in the conversations leading up to this podcast. Jude is fascinated by new design challenges, And in the conversations that we've had leading up to where we are today, Jude has an absolute belief in the iterative design process. And as stated a few times in the conversations that we've had, that there isn't a problem out there that design can't fix. If it gets there at the right time and the right people tackle it, design is the possible solution to every situation. So really looking forward to this conversation today, looking forward to setting a few challenges as well because last night we finished our awesome school with Jude's keynote and he ended with some challenges which we set the teachers that attended and we are opening up this morning to teachers that will be listening to this podcast so without further ado let's get started hey good morning Jude and thanks so much for coming on to this pod this morning pleasure excited to be here it's 12 hours after the autumn school keynote that you did for us and uh, <laughs> we've both had a chance to draw breath and now hopefully we'll lead into a little bit of discussion about that later on. But uh, I'm going to go back, going to take you back same as I do with everybody on the podcast and take you right the way back to school and, and just ask you, what was school like for you? Um, school was, you know, I was really lucky in that I grew up in a small village in the north of England, Cumbria, if people know it. And it was one of those sort of very, you know, leafy, green, nice schools where you're out in the open. But I'd also say that maybe a bit of an odd feeling in that you can appreciate a name like Jude. This was the days before Jude Law was somewhat of a novelty, shall we say. And also the now, of course, I get the compliment, I believe, of Mad Inventor Hair. But actually, it wasn't incredibly racially diverse, let's just say, the town I grew up in. So the fact that my mum was half Nigerian and I sort of followed in that blood lineage means that, you know, I always felt a little bit of a black sheep in more ways than one, really. And so I think it was that odd thing of growing up with creativity being, I think, at times also a little bit of an an escape from not fitting in and conforming. So it's always that odd feeling of, did I choose the creative lifestyle or did it choose me by virtue of the fact I was never going to fit in that well anyway. At what age did creativity sneak in? Was that there from birth? Was it something that was innate in you? There's something that I I feel is always a bit of an an interesting thing to look back on and, and certainly this is informed a bit from years at Lego is the importance of boredom. This isn't in any way glorify or or maybe maybe even trivialize the notion that both of my parents worked really hard. My dad was a builder at the time and my mum was an aspiring entrepreneur trying to set up all sorts of different businesses and ventures, usually out the back of (laughs) the kitchen table, that sort of deal. But it meant that not in any way did I feel sort of hard done by, but because my parents were both working, there just wasn't that, should we say, overindulgence of attention. Yeah. 
so there was a little bit of I wouldn't say my parents were three strikes and, the, and then I was out but they were like well you could do this you could do this and then well the third option's up to you you got to make your own fun and so I kind of had that thing of like I'll get you some clay I'll I'll get you some cardboard boxes or whatever or a game but then after that my parents were like well, I don't know you know make up a game go see your friends go do something go play down by the river or poke something with a stick in the field. And I think it was that sort of exposure to having to make my own amusement and come up with my own sort of, I wouldn't say creative challenges, but in hindsight they were. It was sort of creating experiments for the sake of creating experiments in play. And I think that's why it sort of felt, when I got to Lego, things suddenly made sense (laughs) about my childhood. Yeah. What about school itself, academically, how was that? Well, academically, and I should probably preface to say that, you know, this isn't a criticism of my school at all, because things were different in, you know, the time I was a kid, but I almost certainly wasn't picked up at all for being dyslexic. And so I actually got tested when I was 25 and had already done a degree in chemistry. And so I realized looking back, there was a lot of things where my approach to learning and the way I took on information didn't really make a lot of sense. And it meant that I had quite average grades. And certainly by the time I was at A-level, I had a a B, a C and a D in chemistry, maths and physics in that order. And I think that sort of in contrast, and this isn't for the sake of bragging, it's for the sake of what a difference being correctly identified uh, as having a certain impairment in learning meant is that I ended up getting basically top of the class when I graduated at Glasgow. So for me, it made a huge amount of difference to not have this crutch or this excuse or this, as they call it, disability card, but just genuinely understanding the limitations of what my brain will and won't do in a certain environment. And so having to embrace that and make a virtue of it was a huge journey for me and not just to sort of use it as an excuse. I'd like to think we pick up on that much, much earlier now. Absolutely. And that was my preface for sure, is schools I'm certain would pick up this these days. Well, it's a, it's a common thread through the podcast. I mean, this is a third person that, that, that I've spoken to in the design field that has found their dyslexic after 25, 28, in one case over 30. <laughs> and always suspected there was something there, but it just wasn't a thing back then, was it? It was no. uh, you, you were just a little bit slower than everybody else in the class. That was the way they looked at it. Well, I guess the tricky thing is, I remember I stepped in the room of the psychologist's room when I was in Glasgow, and she's just joked afterwards, and she said, well, it's kind of a little bit of an arbitrary test we did, really, she said, because you kind of ticked all the boxes. She said, it's the highest band are creatives, engineers, and criminals. And she said, I'm hoping you're only two of those. (laughs) It turned out well. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But let's just say there was definitely some things that I'm maybe not going to sort of wave in front of a microphone. But yes, I think when I hear these stories about people who've maybe gone down the sort of a a different path in life, let's just say, there's always that unfortunate thing of that quite a lot of, you know, if you've ever seen the film Catch Me If You Can, Mm. there's a degree of creativity in some of the, should we say, highest performing criminals I mean, I'm not in any way glamorizing the horrors and the horrific things that can happen. But, you know, there's certainly a lot of lateral thinking in coming at things. The mind works differently. It compensates for what it can't do in some areas by becoming much better in other areas. Yeah. And I think without getting too meta about it, I think you could say that that's where the education system could actually appeal to more people by showing how the creative process works. And then for some people, it will be an epiphany to go, ah, right, this is <laughs> the way I see things is valid. And it just happens to be different for everyone else. Yeah. So what about Glasgow University subject? So it was called product design and engineering, which I personally, I have to have to give a bit of a thank you to Morvan Shearlaw, who was, I think, one of the founders of Fearsome Engine, which is a design consultancy. And it's funny, I can't remember actually how I got in touch with them. Might have been back in the early days of the email, but I'd just seen Better by Design, which is a Channel 4 documentary. It's still out there on YouTube if you go search for it, little snippets of it. But basically, I'd had a terrible year after studying chemistry, feeling completely lost, disconnected, not creatively fulfilled. And I'd worked in a butcher's a statistical office for the council. 
and finally uh, horticultural specialists, which we can come back to later, was probably one of the most incredible but also torturous experiences I've ever had. But it, it, all of a sudden that made going back and retraining less terrifying. And so it was actually speaking to Maureen Sheila about the series. And it was quite funny, actually, because she said, I actually did a project in my final year inspired by that show as well, also redesigning the bra, which the TV show did as well. So I really felt like I'd sort of met a sort of kindred spirit, but just someone further down the line. And I guess that's why I'm sort of still picking up the mic with you is to say, I just didn't have any exposure to these stories when I was a lad in Cumbria. And so I sort of feel like, you know, there needs to be people talking about how they got into design, even if it is like mine, a very messy, convoluted route. And I'm hoping that I can connect with people to say, you know, give it a chance, but it's incredibly rewarding if you get there. One of the reasons for this podcast is exactly that, is that, you know, students just don't realise it's something that happens to other people. It's not something that happens to you, you know? And I think we all suffer with that a little <laughs> bit, is that those people are special, whereas actually those people are us. If you want to make it happen, it can happen. Chemistry, can I just go back to that a little of bit? Of course. You sort of swept over that quickly, but <laughs> you were guided and pushed towards chemistry. Uh, it didn't sound like it was a natural choice for you. It wasn't. And when I look back, and again, this isn't to be critical, I think sometimes you're, you know, for anyone listening, it's something I was told later in life, and I wish I'd been told it earlier, which is take a good hard look at the person giving you advice. And so my careers advisor, I think, had the best of intentions. But in all honesty, I don't think he had a creative bone in his body. Mm. And so when I said to him, I'm quite good at art, I really love making things, but I also have got some reasonable potential in the sciences. He said, well, you know, almost no brainer, go for the sciences. At least you'll get a, you know, a proper job out of the end of it. And I guess it wasn't helped by the fact that my parents both studied fine art at Chelsea which I think it's still, you know, reasonably prestigious. So it's a good thing. So this was, for contextually speaking, you know, they did well, but they still didn't end up in a career in fine art at all and ended up being entrepreneurs, as they would say, almost just by dint of the fact they couldn't get a job in anything else. So entrepreneurship kind of chose them a little bit. You know, you could say it was sort of a bit of a, a false negative that just because my parents didn't make it and just because my careers advisor encouraged a more lucrative career, it meant I sort of gave up a little bit. And again, not to be down on the d and classes or the graphic product design classes, there was always this sort of snide comments that it wasn't proper subject. You know, it wasn't going to take you anywhere. And I sort of felt, you know, so sort of dejected by that. But, and dare I say, even people in the class, it used to drive me crazy that I was surrounded by a lot of people. There's probably only two of us in the class who actually really enjoyed d and and took it seriously. And a lot of other people, it was just an excuse to goof around, right. to put it lightly. And so I feel like since then, so much has changed. You know, I love the fact that Big Life Fix, it, it sure as hell isn't the Jude show. It's eight of us all doing all sorts of things. And, you know, the franchise has moved around the world now in, in various, I think there's one in Ireland, there's equivalents in Europe. And I think there's probably, I'm sure America's going to do something similar, maybe with a bigger budget. But I kind of feel like it really does show the power of the design process. And I think, of course, there's a little bit of TV glitz and glamour thrown in there. But I can say from experience, the fear and the anxiety is definitely real. That's not fake. You've mentioned the big life thing, so I was going to get there slowly, but let's let's jump there now. I mean, it's become slightly iconic amongst design and technology teachers because what you're trying to teach students is that design is about so many things, but one of the big things it's about is empathy and, and, and that connection. And there aren't that many subjects on the curriculum that really teach you that you have to have that empathy, you have to have that connection with something in order to make it work. Um and that comes over in the program. And, and you, you, you've mentioned a couple of times in the conversations that we've had that, you know, it was 10% designing, it was 90% connecting with the person, with the issue. Can you talk a little bit about, about some of the problems that you were involved with, with Big Life Fix and how that connection, why that connection was so important? So I think one of the things that is sort of often overlooked is that when you embark on a design challenge as a student, and if you're looking at it going, this just seems from the outset achievable. 
And what I mean by that is like, if someone says to you, you know, you've got a project in an old people's home and they need to undo a jar of pickles or marmalade and they can't do it because they've got osteoarthritis or something and they need a lever. Now, first of all, you, you know, if you're a smart kid, you're going to Google it and realize there's a ton of those products out there. Oxo Good Grips is like king of the hill on this domain. They're incredible at it. Definitely a company I'd love to do work for. But when you look at that, you kind of go, there's not a sort of emotional gauntlet that you have to run to design a pickle jar opener. And I think that's where Big Life Fix differentiates itself quite significantly, is that it's at that point that you made of 10% of design and 90% of you know empathy. And what I realized so much of you know the example I gave last night of working with Kyle is that Kyle has an undeveloped left hand since birth. And the notion that he would want to be a hairdresser without having full utility of those fingers, for most people, that's just a non-starter. And I think a huge amount of the work of that project, which, you know, it's not a criticism of the show, it's just there's only so many minutes in the format you can tell a story. But there was probably a three-month precursor of just getting to know Kyle and actually just validating the seemingly on paper crazy idea that someone without full use of their other hand could be a professional hairdresser. And spoiler alert, you know, a few years since making that, he is actually now a hairdresser. And because he's a good looking chap, he's also a model. And to top it off, he's also in the final of Mr. Gay UK. And I'm not taking credit for any of the, the latter two because he already had those, those gifts already. But I feel like his journey into hairstyling was one where I did spend a huge amount of time just validating that Kyle deserved a crack at this. It does not mean that I could open all the doors and I could be a fairy godmother to this, but I could at least acknowledge that it's possible. And I think once we began that journey together, and I stressed together, Carl was as much part of the design process as I was. Did he believe it? He wanted it, but did he absolutely believe it? I think it was a dance where both of us, you know, where there's a podcast, so I can't show my hands, but, you know, it felt like a sort of two horse race. There was days where I was lacking confidence and Kyle had a moment where he's like, come on, let's just do it. And then there was days where he was like, this is madness. What am I doing? I'm going to be a joke. This is crazy. Why would I put myself through this hell? And I would sort of step forward and push a little bit as well. Or we'd arrive at, you know, a bit of a realization. One of the biggest ones I mentioned last night as well was this thing around that we spoke to literally the best in the industry, Strathclyde, Sarah and Ariane, uh, and prosthetics and orthotics. And even if we had a blank check, we realized that even if we wrote a check for like a million dollars and bought the absolute state-of-the-art hand out there, it would never actually be good at cutting hair. And so we transitioned to a realization that what we've got is the opportunity to build a tool onto his hand. And that that actually offered more opportunities in the world of hairdressing than it did trying to have a a really heavy, complex bionic hand, which also, if you think about it, it was going to have issues with sterilization, water, you know, all the sort of chemicals you put on hair. Really bad idea. You know, you can't autoclave one of those things quickly. It just doesn't work, right? Whereas the tool that we made, you can chuck it at an autoclave, you can cover it in bleach, Dettol, whatever you got to do. And it's nice and sterile. And of course, this was days before COVID, right? So you definitely want to do that now. But that journey was not taken lightly. That was Kyle quite literally having to give up on a dream of would I get, you know, with the blessings of TV and those budgets, an incredible new hand, and instead having to truly embrace using a tool in a really unconventional way. And I'd say the layer on top of that is saying, how can you creatively make a virtue of what on the face of it is a disability and a disadvantage. And so Kyle's in a journey now of where he's gone beyond just emulating how to cut hair in the one, two, three process to actually saying, what is it that I would end up doing with this tool that someone with, should we say, traditional (laughs) tools would never think of doing this? And I think there's something quite special about actually embracing the opportunity that is just unthinkable at the time. You could never walk into the door and be like, hi, Kyle, you're going to create a trademark signature hairstyle because of the virtue of your tools being so different to people using hands. Yet that is now what we're looking at. I think of a journey to get to that point. Yeah. 
And so I think that's the point is it's about the empathy and the belief. And there really is no shortcut. You can't fast track that. <laughs> or at least I'm not able to. I feel like that bit is you still have to put the hard work in. You can get faster at CAD. You can get faster at using a milling machine or a 3D printer. But you can't really fast track human emotions. It takes time. Yeah, I watched it at the time when it first came out. And I must admit, with, with the conversations that we've been having, I went back and rewatched it yesterday. And there's a magic moment at the end of it where you sort of bring out this box and unveil the box. And yeah, it's a TV moment. Yeah, TV, yeah. yeah but <laughs> you know, when you unveil the box, it looks out of this world, what's in there, because it's so nicely made, so nicely arranged. But when he puts it on, he feels comfortable with it straight away. You can see that it, it's like it's almost like this feels natural. This feels like... And he, he makes a very, very good comment in there as well. He said, you know, people look at me with my disability and the first thing they see is my disability. I don't want them to see that. I want them to see mm. Kyle. And I, I guess what that's what design's doing. It's allowing that disability to be irrelevant, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's the thing is allowing for otherness as opposed to, you know, that being a pejorative. I think that's the journey that Kyle is now on is how to sort of have that make sense. And I think you could almost say there's a bit of a parallel with the Paralympics. You know, if you look now, actually, people who have those like spring-loaded, I don't know what you call them, like cantilever legs, I think they're faster than human runners. Yeah, they you are. Know, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But I think, I think that's quite extraordinary that actually, instead of it being like, oh, well, we can't have disabled people running against, you know, real athletes. And you go, actually, you can't have them running against you because they're faster. You know, so I kind of feel like within that metaphor, for me, that's what I'm quietly hoping Kyle will realize is that he will be able to take this, what we refer to as a socket. You know, it's not actually just that little clicky comb. He actually has a bunch of, you know, 10 accessories. And the exciting bit is that those 10 accessories aren't limited to 10. As he goes through his career, I'm excited by the notion that other people will make add-ons for him which I never would have even dreamed. And I might not even have the skill to do. And I think that's where also a designer, you learn a bit of humility to realize I did a cracking job on getting from, you know, let's say A to F, but there's a couple of steps extra where the jeweler, Mark Bloomfeld, really took it to the next level in terms of some of the aesthetics. And also just by sparring with him, we realized some little sort of things we had to iron out, some of the creases in the design to make it better. And I think that's one of the things that I appreciate. I'm coming from this as a professional and 10 years experience, blah, blah, blah. So it's difficult to say, okay, get a bunch of 14-year-olds to do this. But I do feel like you can dial the lesson back to say, it's not good enough just to say you're a designer and you're an island. It is important to say, did you speak to some other people who weren't just your friends or family? Yeah. Test something where you felt, you know, they weren't just going to be nice to you. You're listening to Designed for Life. This podcast has been made possible through the support of our friends at the Edge Foundation, helping all young people to achieve their potential. You mentioned that the initial designs that you were piecing together, people get the idea that design always costs lots of money and it's always very high tech and whatever. You were saying that, you know, it was a couple of combs from Poundland, wasn't it? Yeah. And that's the thing sort of, I think you could almost go back to my childhood is that, you know, I often got a lot of play out of very little. And, you know, I guess it was called being resourceful, but I actually sort of now almost use it as a statement that I work so much in cardboard because I can show that I can outmodel someone with CAD and a 3D printer in obviously certain things, not highly machined, intricate gears or something. Yeah. But in terms of like, building something that maybe has a user interface or needs to understand the spatial considerations, I can knock something up in a couple of hours that would take weeks in CAD, not to mention hours in printing it. And of course, the cost that is associated with that. And I think it's that thing of, I do try to be provocative and say that 90% of Kyle's design was understood and validated by Poundland Combs and Three Bolts. The rest of it was dialing in detail. Yeah. From a curriculum perspective, you've already got most of the grade in the bag by that prototype. But I think one of my frustrations is we give far too much weighting to the dialing in as opposed to all that soft skill stuff of empathy and 
validation and beginning to understand the user's perspective and journey. That's not to just be critical of like, oh, it's the government's fault or it's teacher's fault. It's just to say, we have not created a language or a system or a process that allows us to give good grades. Yeah, we can't measure that. How do you put a grade on empathy? You know, it'd be a hell of a thing to fail at, wouldn't it? You know, so I'm yeah. sorry you failed at empathy, you're out. <laughs> But we joke about it, but really, like, how is it that we could, you know, maybe this is where your average D&T teacher isn't a psychologist. And maybe we actually have to sort of work with a psychologist to say, how do you test empathy when you have actually got to train someone in becoming a psychiatrist? In which case, let's steal that framework, simplify it a bit, but then bake it into D&T. This is the classic thing I feel with design is people always assume that you're a genius because you've invented something. And more often than not, you have done the Picasso thing of you've stole it. People always think stealing means copying. And I increasingly feel it's taking it from a place and reapplying it to an industry or a specialism where it just wasn't seen before. Yeah. And I think that's actually the correct, should we say, interpretation, or at least the one that made sense to me, is that kids aren't taught how to be a therapist at key stage, whatever. But it might be that at a top level, we end up working with some to better understand how to develop a empathy-led curriculum. And so I feel that on the surface, that makes common sense when I say it now in this discussion. But I can guarantee that discussion probably hasn't happened a lot, <laughs> if at all. No, it's something I'm going to come back to in a moment because, you know, we set some challenges last night for the teachers that dialed in. And I want to come back to that in a moment and just talk about that. One of the questions that was asked last night, which is, one that I really want to tackle with you here is one of the biggest problems that we have with students tackling these big issues is that design fixation, where they fix straight away at the start of it. That's the solution. That's oh, where I'm going to go. And they will not be shaken from that, you know. And I actually met an engineer that I probably shouldn't name where it was, a design engineer working for a big company making motorbikes. Let's put it that way. Yep. He said, oh, you're the D&T guy, aren't you? And I said, yeah, I am. And he said, well, do you still do that crap in schools where I've got a really good idea, but I've got to draw three rubbish ones before you'll let me make the good one? <laughs> Which really set me thinking because that's where students want to go. And really, how do we get around that design fixation with, with a 15-year-old that thinks, right, that's the solution, there's nothing else? I can empathise with both of those statements because... I remember being young enough to think, oh my God, I have got a great idea. And then I realized that I was frustrated by exactly that point of I've got to draw free rubbish ideas. And I think all I can say to that is that you're truly selling yourself short. And if you want to take it from someone who's been employed by some pretty good companies like Lego and Dyson, but also not for the sake of bragging, but I ended up turning down a job to move out to Apple but I still went through the gauntlet of that process successfully. And so I truly can say that you do not get any points for saying this was my first off the cuff idea and I built it and I did everything in my confirmation bias to prove that it was the right idea. But I guarantee you, you won't get any jobs in those like top of the tier agencies. They see right through it. And I, I know because I've been that journey, I've been that kid and all of us know what BS that is. And so you have to enter into the state of being truly self-critical because that's what they want to see in the company. They realize they can't employ someone who doesn't know how to be self-critical because it's going to take them too long to teach you how to be self-critical and have humility about your design. And indeed, humility and the diplomacy to, to critique someone else's work in a team. So if you can't demonstrate that you've shown your first idea and then completely disassembled it on every level, be it the nuts and bolts, be it the empathy, be it whatever, price maybe. Maybe you had a great idea, but it's just too expensive. All those sorts of things. If you aren't showing that you can be critical, and then by the time you've gone on that journey, and then not just shown it to your mum or your dad or your classmates, but actually put it out there in the real world and tested it with people who you didn't give a full explanation to how to use it, then if you've done all that, I guarantee you, your first idea isn't going to be the thing you finish with. You're going to see so many holes in that first idea. And also, like, dare I say it, have a little bit of a humility as a 15-year-old. I'm not in any way trying to be rude to a 15-year-old, but chances are you're not a genius. 
whose first idea is absolutely flawless. At what point would you think that's realistic? I'd be very surprised if Johnny Ive says, yes, every time I draw one sketch, I hand it to them, they make it, and it sells millions. It's, it's, like, it's pretty unlikely that even at his level, he can pull that stunt. Or whoever else you want to pick as your you know, design idol. You know, I met Helion Guris, you know, and, and, and you know, she's, she's thick with sketchbooks in her offices. Yeah. And so I just feel like, please, if you're 15, like just have the sort of common sense to realize there's people who are top of their game and at no point would they ever roll with their first idea without any adjustments or iterations. Your first idea with Kyle was a robotic hand, you know, and if you'd have fixated yeah. on that, you'd have never moved past that point. And dare I say it, I feel like I remember getting into sort of quite a tough discussion with the team because I bought what's called a myoband, which is a thing that measures the electrical signals on your arm, you know, and and they were sort of like, are you sure this is the end idea? Because, you know, it's it's expensive. It's $300. Are you absolutely sure? And I was like, I was was quite terrified because I was like, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm I'm like 95% certain this is how we're going to have to go down the route. And actually it wasn't at all. I remember even saying to them, and I think it's only by the grace of the fact that it it ended up in a really good place and Carl was super happy with it. And I think even by the time the editors saw it and the producers, they were like, actually, yeah, this is the right call, isn't it? And I was like, I'm so sorry, but you know, you, you were pushing me to say, is this definitely the right idea? And so of course I had to sort of like try my best, but I really respected them for that when I said, you know what, it's not the right idea. They didn't at any point go, oh, but we've edited it and we've, we've told the story this way. So you've got to do it with the convoluted, expensive and completely, in hindsight, not appropriate solution at all. And so I sort of feel like that's why I loved working with, you know, Studio Lambert and the team there is that, you know, this was regarded in the industry of, you know, the unmakeable documentary. They had a lot of guts to make this show. This is like one of the hardest TV shows you could ever make. It's still regarded as that. Do you think they'll redo it? I mean, given it, given how popular it was, do you think they'd go back and revisit it? I think I have a lot of contractual obligations not to say anything on that, I'm afraid. Fair enough. <laughs> you know how TV is. Um, I'm pretty gagged on that. <laughs> we'll fill that in ourselves. So let's move on. I mean, you put a great post, and, and thank you. You put a really good post on LinkedIn this morning, really supporting design and technology and saying that you can't understand why decision makers aren't backing it and don't get it. I mean, that's my every day. Yeah. It's so obvious to me that if we want creative, energetic, innovative young people, we have to start teaching that at an early age at school and we have to show them what's possible. And let's just take a scenario for a moment, which many people tell me will never come to be, but I'm not that certain. Let's just take that design and technology or something of its ilk disappears off the school curriculum completely Mm. what vacuum would that leave and why would that be important i think the uncomfortable truth is that if you subtracted it most people wouldn't notice for a long time and that isn't because it's not a problem but it's sort of saying like yeah you're not cutting off a leg you don't literally fall over as soon as you replace it but i kind of feel it would be like removing some subtle part of your organ or your brain, <laughs> you know, so you, you, you'd lobotomized something and that it would be a sort of slow death, I feel. And so I think that's what's a little bit unfair is that by cutting funding in d and I'm sure that a lot of people, if they want to analyze it, they will find data that says, look, made no difference. We cut it last year. We looked at the economy. The economy's still fine. Conclusion, must be okay to cut the technology. Yeah. And so I feel like it's a really horrible way if you set the goalposts such that you will get a false positive. The argument is one that, that has come up fairly recently with discussions with high-level people is that it's not a facilitating subject for any degree course in the country at the moment. So universities don't insist on it. Even for product design, engineering courses, you know, it's a nice to have, but it's not a necessity. And government ministers are quite adamant in their view that if you've got maths and if you've got physics, then the middle bit will find you. Yeah. That will just drop on you from on high from somewhere. That design and that inquisitive nature and that empathy that we talked about will suddenly appear from somewhere. I find it hard to believe that you don't have to teach that. No, and I think depressingly, I'm actually a case study in validating that point in that I did study chemistry, maths and physics and creativity on the surface if you were to write it and you wanted to put 
a twist on it that was untrue, you could say, oh, look, yeah, Jude found his way. You know, look at him. He's maybe he's better off that he didn't study all these subjects. And you go, no, I, I very nearly never got back into a creative field. I would have always been working in, should we say, a technical discipline and trying to force creativity into it. Whereas now I have creativity front and center and all the technical things around it for me are just tools. So at the minute, you know, next week I'm about to jump into a project in machine learning and AI. I know comparatively little compared to a domain expert, but that's why I'm going to be working with domain experts. But I know the thing that I bring to the table is I usually see stuff more on the peripheral sides of their profession and bring those bits in. And then that's actually quite energizing for them because they wouldn't have thought about bringing something that maybe I'd experienced at Lego or Dyson or seen maybe an artist do. You bring something left field to the party, really. You're bringing, you're bringing a different view and a different way of thinking that the natural progression perhaps wouldn't bring. Yeah, and I think that's the really hard thing is that it's hard to put a price tag, economically speaking, on creativity. Even though I know that the statistics like, you know, what is it? There's, there's one around sort of 80% of businesses are in the creative industries or whatever. So there's all these sorts of contradictory things, but it feels like we just somehow as a, as a collective don't believe it. Part of what I'm doing here is to try and brag and raise the status, you know, and it's not me bragging from an ego perspective, but it's like, I do lay it out to kids to say, well, when I was in chemistry, I went to a feed factory and spent the day analyzing samples of feed for farms. It was quite good. I went for a lunch break in the park. I ate my sandwiches and went back to do the same thing. When I was in design, I flew out to California. I worked on energy saving light bulbs, new form of a vending machine, a bone marrow drill, as well as helping make a all-terrain robot with prototype this for Discovery Channel and carried a bunch of stuff that I can't talk about all in three months and got paid 13,000 US dollars as a student. And that was still more money than I made per annum at Dyson by a long shot. And so I met my wife in Hong Kong, working in an old people's home in Sha Tin. I studied in Norway for a year, worked on everything from whiskey packaging to fishing boats to making fiber optic bendable surfaces. Um, flew out as part of a design study trip to Costa Rica to work with schools, looking at sustainability in terms of coffee plantations. Went to Cuba to look at how design was growing in all sorts of different communities in very organic ways after all sorts of political upheaval. You know what I mean? The list goes on. I hadn't even graduated. And so the point is, I'm wanting to say that this for me is like, how is this not a rock star career? And I don't mean that as in like, it's flattering to me, but like, look at the other people, you know, in, in the fixed team, they have incredibly exciting careers. Whenever you go to a sort of, you know, a, a dinner party or something and you get the old question of what do you do? It's like, wh why is the government not excited about this career? It's just, it bends my mind to go, what, are you saying that I should go work in finance? And just for the record, actually, I'm super interested in fintech, but I'm interested in it from a creative perspective. So again, for me, it's like, I get to work with all these incredible disciplines and it's through the lens of creative thinking. I can't see how this isn't one of the most bankable things out there. There's a figure of I think the Design Council put £100 billion pounds onto the GDP is created by creative industry, yeah. which is, is a hard figure to ignore. But it's one of those invisible figures that we just take for granted. You know, those, those people will do it anyway. <laughs> we don't need to do it in school. We don't need to educate them. They'll just do it and they'll find it. And to be honest, we always have as a nation. We're a very creative nation. So therefore... We have always turned out the designers. We have always turned out, you know, the Dysons, the whatever. And I think it's taken very much for granted by government. I think the bit that is maybe the saddest part of that is that it's the same people usually who win in that. So if I'm really honest, no, you don't get to swing a punch at me and say that, oh, you came from a privileged background, you know, in terms of finance. I didn't, you know, absolutely didn't. I mean, I remember being at university and you know, my dad needing to borrow money from my student loan temporarily to make payroll for staff. 
did pay it back just to reassure anyone it wasn't a disaster. I remember one Christmas being like, there's just not a lot of presents this year. I hope that's okay. You know, and I understood that. I understood that my parents had tried so hard to do something that they really believed in and was a value, you know, to the community. It was a, a children's nursery. But there's times where I just realized that the support they had was was so such a tough world sometimes to be trying to be innovative. You know, it's an unconventional nursery. Uh, as the first purpose-built one of its kind, uh, I think, in in the country and in, in that class. But it's, I guess, going back to this thing of sort of like, how do you support this? I guess from an economic perspective, if you're saying this is a billion pounds generated from basically not putting any effort in, how many billions would you make if you did put effort in? And I guess you could relate this to marketing. You know, at no point do product manufacturers say, oh, don't worry, uh, this is a great product. It's going to sell itself. <laughs> you yeah. know? So what, what are you going to say? It's like, oh, don't worry, people are naturally creative. They'll go create when they figure out how to be creative. It's no problem. It's fine. How does that logic hold true? If you pushed it, what could be? Yeah, and yeah. I guess back to the point I was going to make is that, yes, the bit that I feel I was privileged in is that my parents did go to art school and they did value creativity even if they hadn't fully realized it in every facet of their life they didn't shoot me down for wanting to try i feel that is the thing when we talk about inequality or privilege and all these sorts of things no it's not about just always making it a race thing but at the same time without getting too much into it my granddad was on my mum's side was black and went to Oxford and married a white woman. Can you even begin to imagine the, <laughs> the nuclear fallout of that? It's spectacular. And so, yeah, I was raised understanding that there is going to be controversy in places always. And how do you sometimes turn it to your advantage? And I think that's a very complex thing that I'm still on a journey. I haven't got a nice little tweet or Instagram poster that I can say of how you fix that. But all I can say is that life is more interesting when you deliberately try to disrupt things which you know are BS. You know, and I think that's where we had discussed the saying, are we going to design programs where deep down we know this caters to middle class privileged kids? Yeah. Or are we going to design a program where we actually turn the tables and we deliberately stack the deck because it's for all the right reasons? And so how do we level the playing field where actually kids who maybe come from a tougher background actually go, you know what, I guess to use the football analogy, how do we make it so it's their home pitch, right? It's the locals supporting for that team because we know that makes a difference in football. So why is it that we don't think it makes a difference in education? So it's this phrase that we used of how do we meet kids where they are? Yeah, I was going to mention that because we've used that phrase a few times over the course of the last few days in, in discussion. And I really get that. If you can meet students with problems that are real to them and are not fixated somewhere else, yeah. made up, then those students will engage with those problems much easier and they'll come up with solutions that, that we haven't thought of as adults because they're not our problems, they're their problems. Yeah. It comes out to the empathy again, doesn't it? You have empathy with the issues that really affect your life. If it doesn't affect your life, it's hard to connect with that. Yep. So there is a danger, and we've all suffered from it, and we've all been guilty of it at times as teachers, is that you have a curriculum that you look at, and you think, well, I have to deliver that because my job is to get that grade for that student so they can go on and do the next thing. Mm. But actually, there's more than one path to that grade. You're listening to Designed for Life. This podcast has been made possible through the support of our friends at the Edge Foundation, helping all young people to achieve their potential. I saw one post last night and online, and it drives me nuts every time I see it. I need a project for year sevens. And it's like, you don't need a project. You need to work out what thinking you need. What challenges do you want to put these kids how do you want to engage them with the subject? What conversations do you want to have? The last thing you need is a wooden box that you're all going to make. But we're still sort of stuck in that in places. I think there's less of it, but we're still stuck in that. So from a curriculum perspective, let's just imagine you were in charge of that curriculum for a moment as a designer. What would you be encouraging kids and teachers to engage with? 
I think the hardest thing, and this is the, I guess you could say a bit of a hypothesis that we're working with at the minute, is that I think the trouble is when, when teachers say, you know, can I have a project for year whatever? I think to read between the lines, what they mean is, can you tell me a beginning, middle and end so that I can lead my kids by the nose through that and tick all the boxes? And for me, this is why design is not taken seriously, because when you get out into the real world, design never looks like that. So either you've been educated in something which is a farce, and when you get into the real world, you're going to fail because you haven't got the chops to know what it's like to start a project, get it all wrong, have to rebuild it from scratch and still win and keep it on on track, on time, on budget. And so I feel that the way you can disrupt that, and I haven't got all the answers to how to do this, but I feel that the way you can disrupt that is by genuinely starting with a problem and the teacher being honest with the class of saying, let's choose a problem that we all think is important. I think, first of all, that gets buy-in from the kids psychologically, that they feel motivated to do it. I think it's interesting as a teacher (laughs) to go, I did not pick this. They are going to take me on the journey as much as I take them on the journey. That's brave as well, though, isn't it? Yeah. You've got to be courageous to do that. And I think that's where we're having these discussions about saying, as a teacher, if you haven't got this nice, comfortable, oh, well, we're going to make a pickle jar opener, then a teacher is always going to be 100 steps ahead of the kids and endlessly capable to sort of, you know, guide them. And I think that's where I kind of feel like there is an elephant in the room of saying, are teachers skilled enough to do something where it is open-ended and they don't know when they're going to rein it in? And I think for me, that isn't about sort of berating teachers and saying, oh, you should feel bad, you're not as good as Jude. That's not the emphasis at all. It's saying that I don't believe there's any real magic to what I do. It's that I follow the design process. You know, it's not to say I religiously follow the design council's double diamond, but actually better by design, the Seymour and Power Show, that's pretty much all it's doing. It was done in collaboration with the design council. So there is no mystery to how I work. The trick is going to be how do we make teachers feel confident to use a process and a framework which has been, it's like 30, 40 years old, isn't it, by now, that process? Mm. And dare I say it, without getting too, you know, I'm not patriotic at all, but it is the British Council. You know, I'm a design associate at the British Council. This is not a problem to connect with them, you know, yeah. and say, how could we reimagine this for the curriculum? But dare I say it, I think, as always, the reason why we're not calling this curriculum reform, we're calling this a pilot or a case study, is because it probably is going to be an exceptional bunch of teachers. And it's not because they're exceptional because they know that they're definitely going to succeed. They're going to be exceptional because they're brave enough to take a chance. And if you look back at Big Life Fix, none of us knew we could finish all those projects. Not at all. There was no, I can say, hand on heart, swear on whatever you want. At no point did we sit there and say, oh yeah, we definitely know how to solve Parkinson's. Absolutely not. And I think one of the things which Hai and Jung, you know, was, it was such a remarkable leap of courage that she had is that on paper, it's madness. If you looked at her CV and says, she's got nothing on here that suggests she could cope with a neurological condition. And even more ridiculous that she proposed a solution, which was about vibrating motors and electronics and pulses and duty cycles. What's that got to do with the brain? What's that got to do with Parkinson's? You'd be the laughing stock if you went to a convention with that white paper and a proposal. But the point is she went to present that when she'd done it and shown that it's not flawless, it's got work, it's not done and dusted, we haven't fixed it, but it's shown that design has a role to play in something where it was never invited to be part of, you know, conventionally speaking. And I think that's what I feel, getting back to the point of how would teachers engage with this, it's saying, how could we support them when truly they are feeling vulnerable and that they haven't got all the answers. And how do we also tell kids, this is the one time where your teacher is not the oracle. The teacher is your mentor, is your guide. You know, they haven't got all the answers. How do we create that relationship from pedagogy to, was it andragogy? You know, adults teaching adults. I appreciate there's a difference in age, there's a difference in life experience. But I think there's something really exciting about saying, For once, teachers don't feel they're just on Groundhog Day. They're saying, yeah, well, last year I did the pickle jar opening thing and I'm going to do it again this year because I know it works and I know we get the grades and we get to high five Ofsted and we blah, blah, blah. 
We've all fallen into that. We've all, We've fallen. all fallen into it. And of course, there's, there's going to be that point where, you know, I know it. Everyone knows it. You're there looking going, this is a Pyrrhic victory. You know, I got my students to get whatever, top of the, you know, grades and whatever. But I know that what we designed is complete nonsense. It's a farce. And I feel like that must be demotivating for good teachers to look at it and go, I ticked all the boxes, but I know when they get out in the real world, it doesn't equip them for anything other than unless they see a linear path to go from A to B to C to D, they're going to really struggle because they haven't got the chops of being wrong 10 times before they got it right. They haven't got the chops of people coming back and going, I tried to use your toy, but I didn't understand it. Yeah. Or sometimes people are so confused, they don't even switch it on. Do you know what I mean? They just give up. And I kind of feel like, how is it that we can support teachers? Because what's going to happen, I think the, the opportunity, and you see this actually in sports, is that the model of coaching is really well developed. You know, if you look at ballet, quite often the madame or whatever is not able to do the moves that they're teaching their students. And yet, isn't that so interesting? that someone is still guiding and mentoring them to reach their highest potential. Does that mean they're a hypocrite? That they're coaching them in something they can't do? Of course it isn't. <laughs> I've done FA coaching badges and I used to coach youth sides in football for quite a few years. And when I did my badges, I did it with a load of pro footballers. Yeah. Now I couldn't do what those guys you did. You ain't no bad no, they, <laughs> they, 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 no way. They were pinging balls around like you would not believe. But actually, they couldn't do some of the stuff that came natural to me as a teacher. Yep. So really the whole FA approach is you don't tell the kid what to do. You stop the play and you ask them, what do you think should happen now? Mm. What do you think you should be doing? So you're not the fountain of all knowledge. What you are is that coach, that guide, that person that just shows another way. And I think that's the approach. Let's make it clear what the ask is, because I think we've got to be crystal clear here. A, we haven't got all the answers here. I mean, and this is a discovery path for all of us, really. But what we've decided is that we want to try and gather together a, a small group of teachers who are willing to look at teaching bigger problems. And you've mentioned the bottle opener a few times. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at finding real problems that are real to the kids. And it could be around any one of a number of themes. It could be bullying. It could be sustainability. It could be, I mean, it's open. And we want to actually try and help those teachers and their students to try and explore these problems in a much, much deeper way. And it might not be that we have an end product as such. It could be a system. It could be whatever it might be. We don't know. Mm. We will scaffold it. We will make sure it's safe. We'll make sure that we're doing all the things we can to support them. But really what we want is some courageous teachers to stick their hands up and say, yeah, I'm willing to go on that journey. I'm willing to give it a try. Is, is, does that sum it up? I think that sums it up well. I think I'd add maybe another provocation is that I remember when I was at Dyson, I was there four years and I remember being so excited that I started to understand the nuances and the technicality of injection molded plastic. For the record, I was like really good at it for my age. Maybe it's the dyslexic thing because you have supposedly have a bit of advantage with the 3D spatial awareness. But I was really good at understanding how it was all going to go together. But I realized so quickly, this is not what Britain is renowned for. And then when I thought, oh, I'm really good at this, you know, we send it over to Malaysia and realized that either they did it 100 times quicker or they realized mistakes that I had made and still did it better. And so I feel like, again, are we going to train kids to just make stuff which deep down anyone in industry goes, that's not why I hired that graduate. I'd never hired that graduate for their knowledge of how to use a 3D printer. I never hired them for their knowledge of how to make stuff out of cardboard. I hired them for their ability to roll with the punches, to be critical, to test in the real world and truly to live and die by the design process, that the whole journey is as important as getting over the finish line. And that sometimes I would still give someone a job, even if they didn't get over the finish line, but their journey was epic. And I guarantee you all of the companies I've worked for, the same principle. You know, if they've seen someone really wrestle, and I guess all I'm really saying is that how could we bring that into the teacher's way of life? 
not just the students, that they are saying, I do not know when I start this project whether I'm going to be able to necessarily tick all the boxes for Ofsted. But boy, are these kids going to come out the other side changed. They're going to grow so much in their potential, in their the esprit de corps. Instead of just being like my grade, your grade, they're actually going to pull together as a team and that they realize that their first idea isn't the best idea and that there's real satisfaction when you go to the 10th idea and you see someone with it in their hands and it's intuitive and there's joy in whatever you did. That for me is the reward. And I feel like how could that not be the proudest moment as a teacher? where you see a kid's pride knowing that they've gone through the highs and lows, all the mistakes, all the problems, and you didn't tell them the answer, you helped them discover it for themselves. That for me, I feel, is what we need to help teachers build a scaffolding where they're not the oracle, they're the coach. I agree. And just one point that you made there about Ofsted, I don't think Ofsted is a problem. Ofsted really want teachers to have a vision. Yeah. They want them to have a clear direction and then a plan of how they're going to get there. Now, we're going to have all of that. So there is nothing that we're proposing that is anti-Ofsted. It's this no. aligns with what Ofsted want. They want, they want. So where do you think it gets lost in translation then? It gets lost in translation a little bit because we fall into expectation. We fall into the demands of the GCSE, the demands of the A-level and the, and the demand to get the highest possible grade for every student. And the ability to allow students to go and create gets lost by the demands of the system. Yeah. And I think we can create that space. I think a lot of the shackles that we create, we create them mentally. And we say, well, we can't do that because I haven't got time. Yeah. I can't do that because it doesn't fit in the curriculum. Well, the curriculum it's not a Bible. It leads you towards these are the things that could be asked in an examination. But what we're testing is we're testing kids that have really got an ability to design, mm. that they've got that grit. I mean, uh, you know, for positive psychology, that ability to stick with something, work their way through a problem, come out the other side. These are the employable bits. You're quite right. I've not met an employer at all that said I will only ever look for this grade <laughs> and the, the other things don't matter to me. Yeah. What they're all saying is, I can teach the content. Yeah. We can teach that. That's easy. Actually, what I want is the soft abilities to actually, that that student comes because it takes me too long to teach that, which you've alluded to earlier on in the conversation. Yeah. But yeah, the grades are important. I'm not saying they're not, but I'm saying that if we pick the right year group, and I'm thinking year nine is probably the best year group for this, possibly year mm. 10, where you actually have got that little bit of space and you can think, right, I'm not going to spend six weeks now, seven weeks talking about materials and looking at properties of materials. Instead of that, I'm going to look at these skill sets that we want in these students yeah. to allow them to then go on and be liberated designers in year 11 and thereafter. I completely agree with your point that the grade is not the problem, but I guess you could almost make an analogy and maybe this is a bad one, but you wouldn't grade a chef on how well they plate up and present it on the plate you'd grade them on how it tastes. And I feel like right yeah. now we're grading them on how it looks, not how it tastes. Because yeah. that's the real truth, right? You know, that's why they say the proof is in the pudding. It's always this thing of like, you're saying, did you design something by the book? And you go, look, here's the end result. It ticks all the boxes. But if you kind of go, wow, I looked at that kid's project. They've gone through all the highs and lows. They've made so many mistakes. They've had their friends tear it apart and rebuild it with them. They've tested it with more than just, you know, their mum and dad. You'd employ that kid in a heartbeat. The other thing is, like, it's hard to explain this to kids, but being a bit of a BSer as a kid, it's sort of like, don't try and trick me. I know all your tricks. You know, they, they think they're being smart by, you know, mm. rendering it or doing a nice sketch. And you're like, I've done all these tricks. I've played all these games. I know. It's like going to a magician that you got, you know, a little box of 100 greatest tricks and you go to a magic circle magician and go, oh, I better fooled you. And of course you don't. Don't be ridiculous. Don't trick or treat. No, we've been there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so I feel like if you come to the table and say, look, I, I know I'd like a job at Apple, but I'm really into pigeons. And I designed this amazing thing that, 
you know, helps them against these diseases. You know, they always get these like mites and it's really, really dangerous and there's spores. And I, I figured out an air purification thing for their cages and I found a better way to track them. And I got really interested into how they navigate and, you know, how do you breed them better and all this sort of thing. I guarantee you, pigeon kid would get the job, <laughs> you know, because you kind of go like, wow, that kid went really deep. And it's exciting because they're excited. The thing you really notice about designers is that they're really easy to infect with genuine enthusiasm. You know, if someone's like, I'm really into making rainbow bands or something, you, at first you sort of think, really? And then if they're like, no, 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 you, you think this is going to be boring, but wait, I've taken this to the next level, then I guarantee you those are the people you employ. In all of those companies, it's the people where you go, how did you take that to the next level? And that's what I'm saying. I appreciate I've been really down on the pickle jar opener. But if someone was like, no, 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 Jude, wait, this pickle jar opener is some next level. And I'll be like, all right, show me. And if they're like, yeah, I also got these five people in the care home who had never cooked a meal in their life. And I also realized that whilst we were doing the, the pickle jars, I realized that they were really, really homesick for these dishes. And so the problem wasn't really the pickle jar. It was actually how to put together a simple recipe that they can make in one saucepan. I'll be like, yes, the job is yours. Because it's, it's that point you said of like, even if we take that kid who said like, I've figured it all out. It's the first thing. I'm like, right. So keep pushing. Let's say you are that genius and you figured out. But if you keep saying, yeah, I invented the pickle jar opener, but I realized that they couldn't make the rest of the dish then that suddenly becomes your actual design project. And I think that's, you know, to, to go back to Kyle, it started off being like, how do you cut hair? It's the problem with the fingers and the hands. That wasn't the project. It was about tools in the end. And it was about Kyle believing in himself and knowing how to essentially sort of play the game a bit as a personality and reinvent himself. And so I feel like that's the bit I would love to see teachers feel that they can mentor kids in that journey to say, even if we have a really stubborn kid and they're just absolutely holding their ground. And I've seen this with, you know, projects where they go, I'm really into music. I'm going to make a guitar for my final year project. You're like, please take it beyond just making a guitar, you know, make it so that it's, I don't know, waterproof, <laughs> you know, make it so that it folds up into something the size of a shoebox. Just do something which I've never seen before, but that has a genuine need communicate that you did it for a reason as opposed to I thought it would be cool in which case you don't need a design degree you should drop out of 16 and set up a business and that's okay too if you know that you're going to make the best widget out there and you already know how to do it the design will maybe help make you more efficient or whatever but it's also a very long way around to if you truly believe that you know you should do that and I feel there's plenty of people, you know, plenty of biographies you can read where actually they do do that. And that's fine. But I guess the only thing I'd say to them is that design is a powerful way of thinking about what you do. And I think that's the thing I would still say, even if you did create the greatest widget, you could still go and do a, you know, an MA or whatever it is later in life. And I bet you you'd still come out really having good analytical skills to criticize your work and improve your business. Do you find that the students that are best at it, one of the joys of my job is I get to see some of the student work in, 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 a, in a world before COVID. You get to see the exhibitions of students at degree level, etc. Not one of those students is standing there saying this is finished. No. Every single <laughs> one of them. If you start talking to them, they said, if they gave me another four months, this is what I would now do. Yeah. This is where I would go. They're on a journey with it. And that journey would never end if you allowed it. And might I add, those people still get the jobs. Yeah. And if anything, you sometimes get the job because you realize the flaws in your design. You're honest about that. You show humility. And also that you're proactive and you say, yeah, if I could just get a bit of funding and do this and this and this, then I'd take it to the next level. Because that's what the real world is like. You never get through R&D going, it's done, let's sell it. It's always like, it's done, but it's too expensive, or it takes too long to develop, or the market suddenly moved from when we originally developed the idea. There's always a tweak every single time. So if you've come out of school or whatever, realizing that the game never finishes, that's all the employer needs to know that you figured it out at that age. Yeah. Jude, I'm going to bring us to a point. Before we do that, I just want to make it clear to everybody, what we're asking for is, is schools that are willing to take a chance, are willing to enter a discussion 
And we're not 100% clear what we're going to do with this. Really, what we want to do is have a conversation with the schools, work out what's possible, work out what we could do, and then set something in motion which we can then monitor and, and check the progress of. So if you're out there and you think, yeah, that could be my school, that could be me, then contact us. I mean, email is probably the easiest way. It's tony.ryan at data.org.uk or Destech Ryan on Twitter. You can get me on either of those. Just let us know that you're up for it and you're up to explore it and then we'll send you out more details. Jude, thank you so much. Thanks for last night. Last night was brilliant. I think it was really good. We've, <laughs> we've carried it on today. And thank you for your involvement so far. And I've, I've got a feeling we're at the start of something. I don't think this is the end of something at all. Hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Take care. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. I know I did. If you are interested in getting involved, then please do contact me, tony.ryan at data.org.uk. And Twitter handle is at des, D-E-S, tech, Ryan, at des, tech, Ryan on Twitter. Please get in contact with me on one of those. If you enjoyed this podcast, thank you. Please subscribe and please take a moment at the end of this just to go in and give us a review. Really, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, it makes all the difference and, and helps us to grow that listenership just a little bit more. And finally, I just want to thank again our friends at the Edge Foundation for their sponsorship, which makes this possible. Without your help, we just could not do this. Thanks so much for listening. Take care. And until the next time. See you soon. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. If you did, hit the subscribe button now as we have guests lined up for future pods that will inform, inspire, and entertain. This podcast is brought to you by the Design and Technology Association.